Welcome to The Art of Adventure. This is episode 286 with Nancy Duarte. The Art of Adventure is the podcast where we look at human potential, entrepreneurship, unconventional lifestyles, and cutting-edge science. I'm your host, lead explorer and guide, Derek Loudermilk. Check out DerekLoudermilk.com for the show notes for this episode and links to all the things we're talking about and for upcoming events, product releases, books, and things that I'm working on. All right. Today's episode is with uh, Nancy Duarte, and I heard her on other podcasts like uh, Lewis Howe's School of Greatness and Jordan Harbinger's show before, before I got the chance to interview her. And because of those podcasts, I went out and bought a couple of her books right away, uh, Illuminate and Resonate, which have to do with storytelling. And today we're talking about storytelling with data. She's got a new book called Data Story. And we, we actually talk a lot, of, a lot more than just using data to tell stories. But, but data is so prevalent in our world. Like all of our devices are collecting data all the time. And this goes beyond just interpreting in it, making a cool visual and it goes beyond just storytelling, but how to use data and weave that into a story when you want to change someone's behavior or change organization's behavior or lead or help an organization or company make a decision. So there's a lot going on here. And while I had her on the show, I, I wanted to make sure I asked her about some of the things that I think are important in storytelling, such as such as characters and, and being able to see ourself as a character in a story. And she told me that she uses the story framework for herself, especially when she's going through a hard time. She likes to see herself as a character in her story and, and in that moment of struggle, which is the really good part in a lot of movies and stories and things like that. And so there's there's some personal things in this interview. You know, we talked about what it's like to be married to someone who is very opposite us. We both have that situation and and how to make it work effectively. So this is a very personal and and connecting episode with someone who has worked with the biggest companies, you know, your Apples, Googles, General Electrics, most of these organizations and politicians that are shaping our world, she's helping them tell stories. So this is a great opportunity. And without further ado, here is Nancy Duarte. Nancy Duarte, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me, Derek. And I thought we'd jump into maybe a personal part because we were chatting a little bit before the the show and about you know being entrepreneurs, but also the role of marriage and relationships in that. And you know, I thought it's an interesting similarity we have of being married to people that are quite different from us. And I'm curious about. To, to what extent? Because I think your husband w was involved in the business. Are you, do you guys still work together or is he still actively in, engaged in the business as well? He's not as actively engaged. So he's gone back to his fine art. So he works on Tuesdays and Thursdays here, um, mostly signing checks and stuff. So he's not really active involved because he's um, focusing on his fine art, which is fun. And, and I guess my question for you is um, at one point started a podcast with my wife and she didn't really like it. And um, so she said, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore, um, which is which is fine. And I, I used to come from a place of I really want people to be like me. Uh, and I guess I didn't realize the, the, the differences that other people had. So how do you navigate like when when you have such different personality types as your husband, like in, in, in a marriage or, or working together? Yeah, it's funny because we, we talk about um, starting a channel about talking about being an entrepreneur and, and he's enthused until I actually say, okay, let's go in the room and start to film. So I get it because I think people who are comfortable, you know, being on a podcast are usually married to people who would not be as comfortable doing that. And we, we had a real clarifying moment. So he actually started the business. And then two years later, I joined him. I thought it was a really stupid idea. And I told him, I said, look, if I can sell it, you can keep it. If I can't sell it, this stack of resumes are going to get mailed out. And so I made three phone calls that afternoon to Apple, NASA, and Tandem, which is now Hewlett Packard. And we won tons of business. And so suddenly I was 
an entrepreneur. I, you know, we, I wasn't expecting that. And um, what's really interesting is about seven, eight years into us working together, we had a, a life coach who said, hey, um, let's write a life mission statement for each of you. And he had this binder full of verbs. I'm not kidding. And and so he said, the most important word in your life mission statement is the verb. So Mark's like, okay, he flips open these col- pages and pages of columns of verbs. And his verb is like the third one down in the first column. And mine, I go through the whole binder and I'm like, <laughs> I start to cry. And I'm like, I'm so weird. My verb isn't even in a v- binder full of verbs. And he's like, well, what's your verb? And I said, well, it's to conquer or maybe to liberate. Like, it's one of those two. And I'm like, what's your verb, honey? And he's like, to relax. And I'm like, holy cow, (laughs) holy cow, like, it's so opposite. And so part of the process with this coach was to do um, personality profiles, like the DISC profile. And I came out like off the charts, high D, high I, no S, no C. And my husband is like, no D, no I, off the charts, S and C. And we formed the letter X, like when you plot our temperaments. And I think what that did for us is we actually hardwired a value into our culture that is to honor each other's differences. Because it is true that like, it's like he completes me. He's everything I'm not. And we had to start to look at it that way. Otherwise, it could be a a point of tension. Because the report when it came back said that um, we would either hate each other or if we found a way to value each other's difference, we would feel like we complete each other. And I thought, you know, that's a life value is to really honor each other's differences. And about seven years into our marriage, um, marriage, not seven years into the business, I was trying to henpeck him into my likeness. I was trying to henpeck, where's your passion? Why are you not working hard? Where, you know, how come you're not animated? But, you know, I was trying to like, I thought he needed to be more like me. And then he tried really hard to be like me. And I was like, ew. I barely like myself. Like I was attracted to some, <laughs> like a battery, like a magnet, right? You're attracted to people that are not like you. And he tried so hard. And I just, I felt so bad for him because he wasn't enjoying trying to be like me. And so I just threw in the towel on that approach completely because <laughs> it didn't work. So now we just, I don't know, we just delight each other. We really like each other and 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 do kind of fulfill a need in each other that's... Um, kind of is, makes us complete oddly or beautifully i guess yeah i've adopted a similar view you know for everything that that perhaps would or still does aggravate me i'm i'm always thinking like there is there is a lesson here something that i've never experienced from my point of view but is super clear to her and, and so i, I just, so now i'm always like learning something super curious mm-hmm. digging into to like yeah what it's like to be someone completely opposite <laughs> yeah and I, it's interesting because you're almost approaching it like a student right like i'm gonna study like like the scientist you are right it's like a you could, you could research and study it and actually get to know and understand it and some people uh, don't take the time and discipline to do that step yeah so that's an uh, interesting segue in it because it seems like you have a lot of curiosity as i was watching your ted talk I think you said you transcribed thousands or hundreds of talks to see their format. And it sounds like you did that with this book as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where, you know, where does this sort of like obsessive curiosity come from for you? Obsessive is probably the perfect word for it. I don't, I don't know. Like, I feel like communication is so bad right now and it's just it's just um causing so many of life's ills and global problems that people can't communicate and if i can play some small part in bringing clarity and meaning and empathy into how people are communicating it just it feels like a great thing to be called to right now and so um with the vast amount of data because this book is um called data story and i'm finding that data Data was slowing my own organization down. And I'm only 120 people. I'm not this behemoth, but we're using it for freaking everything. Obviously, the finances, we have registrants to our training, we have project flow, we have people resourcing on projects, we have data coming in from our marketing funnel and our sales funnel. I mean, I just am inundated and I just felt like, my God, this data is actually slowing me down. And it's actually slowing down decision making, not speeding it up. So part of um, part of the um, genesis for this book was to try to figure out what is the best way to communicate with data so that it's actually valuable and has meaning instead of it, you know, (laughs) slowing everyone down. 
Yeah, could you speak to, you said um, bad communication is causing problems in our world. Is there an example that you're thinking of <laughs> when you say that? Well, I mean, there's the news. You could just look at the news and almost every, so much is just, so much is a breakdown in communication and a lack of empathy, I think. So I just, I'm, it, it affects everyone. A young kid today, my daughter's a science teacher, and it's like they're just, they're entering the system and entering into these um, constructs without uh, the ability to communicate in a way that is going to help them long term. So I, I just think there's a systemic uh, communication problem that that makes me nervous, you know, for another generation or two, what, what we're going to be like. It's social media, it's, it's news, it's fake news, it's, you know, it's discerning the truth from a lie. It's, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, please tell me, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I was wondering if there's like a specific um, specific story you're referring to. I'm curious about where, where's the best place to like the first Early ROI, if you want to look to improve your communication, like what is the first thing we should look at? Definitely empathy. I think we so often have a sense of urgency about what we need to communicate, the message we need to get across, what I just learned I need to tell people about, you know, this new initiative we need everyone on board for. It's very me-centric, very much about me. And in reality, if you put your idea out there for an audience or for your company to contend with or your customers, if they don't adopt it, you're hosed. So in reality, your audience is the hero. You're not the hero. You're not the central figure. They are. And we have to just change our lens under which we look at communicating and really spend some time thinking about, wait a minute, who who, who, are, who are we talking to? Why? Who's going to be against this idea? Who's going to be for it? Really sit and think through it. We just did a project for a, a big brand, a customer, a day long. It was a half day workshop, actually. The whole workshop was a day, half the day, empathetically thinking through exactly how various constituents are going to react to a uh, uh, to this idea, to this proposed initiative. And in the process, they decided, oh my gosh, the stickiest contingency uh, isn't going to like who's actually even presenting the information. We actually need to change who our presenter is. And I'm like, holy cow, that's so profound, right? Mm, wow. Same message, same message, same everything. But if you just change up who has the most credibility with your stickiest audience, that it, it, it turned into a breakthrough uh, moment for the whole team. So it, it's kind of interesting how a, a walk in someone else's shoes for a little bit will change and shape how you communicate and what you communicate. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. That's that's really that's really cool. I never would have thought about the different presenter. Hmm. I'm thinking back to. Well, I, okay. So actually, I have a question about because we're talking about data. We've got slides often and then i've also heard you know going without slides and huh. looks looks like you know what you're talking about or huh. you, you know if you can just speak impromptu or or lead without having slides and that that confers some credibility or authority so when would you want to have visualizations versus just going completely off because uh-huh. i know i think steve jobs really didn't like to use slides for example yeah, his slides were his. He used them the way they're supposed to be, where the slides are a visual aid. Um, so, if I were to rank the importance of of um, of what you were talking about, I would rank the content first, how you deliver it as the second most important, and slides I would rank third in importance. So, I think the importance of slides are to get a great metaphor across, to be a backdrop to showcase what you're talking about. But I think also diagrams are really important because if the audience can see what you're saying and they can actually have a co-understanding around a model or a mental model or a way of uh, process and stuff like that. So I think there's really important times to use a visual. Um, But I also think you should know your material so much that if the slide projector doesn't work, you're fine. Like you should be able to still stand and deliver. So it really is about understanding the content and delivering it from a place of conviction versus um, using slides as a crutch. Sure. Yeah, that makes total sense. And so, so I'm remembering back to my science days and we would, from the sort of audience side, we would do what's called journal club and all sort of get together to try to decipher perhaps a new 
scientific publication. And in particular, we'd focus on the figures and the data and try to say, like, okay, let's look at the, you know, the axis on this graph. And, you know, what does this tell me? How, what's my interpretation? And like, does it agree with what the scientists are saying? And it was quite, you know, to, to go through maybe like a five page paper, it took an hour to, to really talk about it and understand the data. And, you know, so that thinking like, oh, okay, this is this time consuming and unwieldy process. Well, to be able to then if you're the originator of some some data or visualization, like you want to be able to quickly communicate what what the story is. So I guess what I'm asking is how how can data be used to communicate more clearly than 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 causing confusion? Yeah, it, and the the way I kind of position um, where my book steps in is that it, the process you just went to say to understand the data or even align with it, because sometimes you may have context that the authors had not considered. My book starts to kick in, like the data is done. You've you've finished the data, you finished the research, you finished the process of analyzing and synthesizing the data. And usually once you have dug into the data and you're kind of done, you've either found an opportunity or a problem in the data. And that's when communication needs to start. You need to communicate what the opportunity is and how to exploit it, or you need to say, "Uh uh-oh, we found this problem, we need to solve it. Both of those things, interestingly, are verbs, and I started this whole conversation talking about verbs. You need to go off now and do a verb so you change the future data. So, humans generate a lot of the data that organizations use today. So, let's say you found a problem or an opportunity, that means you're hoping to be able to change minds and behaviors so that your future data is different than the current data. And so that takes communication and that's where this book kicks in. So we don't get into how do you analyze it, how do you understand it. The assumption is that you that the hard the researchers, the data analysts, the synthesizers have already done that and now you're at the phase where it needs to be communicated and communicated well. And to do that, you can use story frameworks and by story, I don't mean like fiction and fairy tales. I mean literally the well-known common understanding of the structure of a story and you you slip your data into this framework and then people can understand it, they'll remember it, they'll recall it, and, and that's what this book's about. And, you know, as, as with learning a lot of things, it seems like there's, at first, when, you, when you're, like, plugging things into a story form, it might feel contrived or, like, formulaic, and at some point, it, it would move to sort of unconscious, and you're, you can just sort of put things into stories as they come out of your mouth. When people are starting to to use stories or, or what would you say to someone who is like in their first steps of, of using story to communicate data? That's a good question. You know, it's so funny how people are comfortable at a cocktail party or at, at dinner with family telling stories, but then the minute it, it has to translate into a work function, they sputter, you know? And what's so interesting about data is there's people that are so deep in research and deep as a data scientist that embracing story is hard. And then there's others who are maybe strong communicators and use story where embracing data is really, really hard. And I think both need to change on both ends of the pole there. What's really kind of shocking is um, artificial intelligence is already able to choose data sets, to synthesize it, and to make observations about the data. Like even a tool as simple as Tableau, Tableau's not simple, but a tool like Tableau can go in and you can put some data in. It'll be like, oh, Jimmy Bob in sales quarter over quarter, his sales are down. And it'll tell you, it'll have a finding in the data that you may or may not have been able to find yourself. So it'll say, Jimmy Bob year over year is down this quarter. Now, what you do about Jimmy Bob being down this quarter is a different thing than what what do you do to communicate to Jimmy Bob about the data? That's a whole different thing. So the people who stay deep in the data and um, may stay individual contributors because and eventually AI could replace a portion of their jobs. So what has to happen is you need to go from being one who just digs in the data to one who actually starts to become a strategic advisor about what the data is telling us to do. So it's like a career transition that not everybody needs to make or wants to make, but it definitely will move you up in an organization if you learn how to become a strategic advisor from the data. And that's, that sounds like moving into leadership in a sense, but perhaps like you have this data and it tells you, you know, a, a indicated course of action, but then 
you know, sort of recommending that to people who make decisions is something that that could be intimidating because you're like sort of leading upwards to, to yeah. perhaps people that are above you. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, I think your um, listenership, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. And so people, if they're either by themselves or if they have a staff, people are probably communicating to them all the time. And I wrote a a piece in here. Um, I don't know if I'm the only CEO that's ever written a piece about how executives like to be communicated to, but we are measured. I mean, anyone on the podcast understands this, the thing that an executive is most concerned about is the organization's performance around money, market, and exposure. And so an executive, like all of our KPIs, everything is around these things. And and we're trying to drive revenue and profit up and costs down, that's money, under market, We're trying to gain market share or reduce the time to market. And under exposure, we're trying to drive up retention of customers, clients, and we're trying to drive down risk. Those things, when you're trying to communicate up, um, these are the things that you have to appeal to um, so that your idea can be heard. Because if it doesn't fall into one of these things, it really shouldn't hit the desk of an executive anyway. So um, it's, it's kind of an interesting question there about using language that appeals to an executive audience um, is an important step if if that's part of what you do in your daily routine. Yeah, and I think there's uh, perhaps a certain amount of training people how you want to receive your information or, you know, to, to yeah. say, like, here here's the things that I care about and here's where I want you to sort of proactively craft your message. Yeah, I train my team. I okay? I had I trained them. I'm like, look, I prefer read ahead. So they all know like a five to seven page slide doc. They send it to me on email um, at least a day ahead of time. And then when we do meet, we're having a conversation. Like the last thing I want to have happen is them flip it into slideshow mode and take up a whole hour just to get one idea across when I could read it quickly and we're in problem solving mode immediately. But I had to train my team. I think not everyone wants to work that way. And so I definitely, when someone is onboarded as a direct report, We have a whole conversation about how I prefer to communicate and how it is alike or different than how my new direct report prefers to communicate. So I can adapt to them too. I have one exec who started and her favorite thing is to start emailing at about 5.15 in the morning, (laughs) you know. And so it's like, okay, let's make it so you email me at those times on Tuesdays and Thursdays and not every day so that I can get my early morning work done or whatever. So you just have to have open conversations about how you send and receive feedback and, and communicate. Yeah. And then so I'm I'm curious about who this book is written for and who does using data apply for like and and I'm thinking of you know Instagram influencers or or solopreneurs or or digital marketers or is this exclusive to the corporate world or like what is the, what is the range of of uses for using data to to persuade it? Yeah, I mean, data is, is impacting every role. It's like sixty per sixty seven percent of all roles now are enabled by data. So as a solopreneur, I mean, when I say data, that's a P and L. Like that's sales numbers. Those are all. Um, types of figures. When you talk about influencers or people who have to convey information or especially if they have to travel or speak, there's a whole section, um, section four in the book that talks about how do you make the data relatable? How do you make it stick? How do you make it so people really understand it? And so I don't know how many of your influencers actually even who their audiences are, but man, when you're talking to customers and you're trying to win a customer or you're trying to market your yourself, all that stuff is data driven. And so how you shape it and communicate it will help others take action. Maybe, could, could you give an example of just, just a yeah. bit concrete for our listeners? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if there's marketers in the audience. So there's like a three act structure where once you have a discovery um, in the data, there's a way to frame it in a way that will um, uh, create action. Now, 
if they're a solopreneur, it, it doesn't hurt for you to even just do this as an exercise for yourself because in the data, the most important thing that you want to do to create a point of view about it is to decide what is the verb I want other people to do because of this data. So if we were to look at just a super simple situation with a shopping cart, let's just say you are a solopreneur and you have an e- e-commerce um, business. Let me just see if I have that one. You can have a 3x structure about, do I have that? Let me just use this example about like a webinar, like if you have influencers. Sure. So there's a 3x structure. And what's happened is act one is our new webinar on cloud services attracted more attendees than the historical high. So that's kind of your current state. Act two is that 642 highly qualified leads came in from the webinar and it surpassed all other marketing channels by 22% last month. And then the third act is your point of view of the action you need to take. Therefore, we should redirect some marketing funds to rec- to cover quarterly webinars and increase our highly qualified lead flow. So it's just a little tiny lockup. It's like an executive summary. It says, this is what happened in the data. This is the actual literal statistics from the data. And if we start to behave this other way, we'll change our future. And so it's just a little tiny way to get to the third act, which always has, therefore, we need to take this action because of what I found in the data. So even if they only do that is, let me look at the data and then what is the action we need to take from it? It's a really good discipline to make sure you don't just look at data for looking at data's sake, but you actually look at data to create meaning, which causes positive outcomes. Does that make it more down to earth? That's super simple. And I think I I caught a little hint of the sort of here's where we are now and here's the like better future, the sort of the contrast that Uh you, you mentioned in a lot of these, like some of the best speeches in history have this sort of like uh, yeah. going back and forth between current situation and cre- creating a better future kind of thing. Uh, could you, uh-huh. can you talk a little bit about that yeah. mechanism? Yeah, it's kind of cool. So in my um, digging into story and storytelling, one of the most interesting things about a story is the cathartic release. Like there's this building of tension during a movie, like you could say, and then it, and then you get an emotional release and then the tension builds and then there's a release again. And I knew that was some sort of story mechanism that was very, very important. And uh, when I when I figured out this kind of rise and fall, I remember this moment where I thought, you know, speeches do have a cadence to them and a rhythm. And and I was wondering if that rise and fall was part of the cadence to them. And I did have literally a book called The 100 Greatest Speeches of All Time. And then I've looked at several hundred since then. And I figured if if whatever it was that was kind of magically done by Martin Luther King in his I Have a Dream speech, yes. if what was done there was also, say, done by Steve Jobs in his iPhone launch speech, if I could find a pattern between those two very different applied, you know, situations for a speech, then maybe that would kind of crack the nut. And that was where I found this structural device, this rise and fall of tension, like what you were talking about, comes from the contrast of our current realities of the status quo, if we keep going this direction juxtaposed to what it is that the better future would look like when people say oh here's today oh but look here's what could be and here's what is but here's what could be they can see the contrast and it makes the current realities less appealing and makes the uh, the allure of the future um, more appealing so it is a structural device that's used in the greatest speeches and i've ever all of them now i've looked at almost all political figures and some of the most powerful um, speeches of all time. And it's there inherent in all of them. It seems like that is a common sales or persuasion technique as well. A little bit. Like I think great salespeople really understand the impact that whatever they're selling will have on the person they're talking to. And so they need to understand, oh, and if you do, this is how it'll impact your future. This is what your future world will look like if you buy our product, or this is what, you know, your life could be like with this new tool in your day-to-day routine or whatever. Uh, yeah. And now we're getting, we're coming back to the empathy piece because you would have to sort of understand what would, what would actually be meaningful for them to, to think about a future. Yeah. That would be meaningful. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Quick question about podcasting, not necessarily using data, but in terms of story, is there anything that that I could take as a podcaster or are there any mistakes that a lot of sort of interview podcasts 
make or ways that they can improve by incorporating better story format or certain certain elements in their shows. Yeah, I mean, one thing you did that not everyone does is you gave me right away an overview of who your audience is. And that helps me, right? That helps make the content here more relevant to whoever you've chosen as the channel that you want to have your podcast appeal to. I, I do a lot of podcasts and I've only had four of them do that for me. And that you know, I like that, right? Because you hear me say empathy centric a lot. And um, so that's one thing they could do. The other thing is, I think teeing up questions, the, the, or reading the, the book, like being familiar with the the um, speaker and whatever is their um, value they could bring to the audience and mapping the questions to the value of your listeners is really good. I prefer the free form format, like what you're doing. I like to be kind of surprised with questions. Some people, <laughs> some people give me like, I'm going to ask you this in this exact order and da, da, da. And then I feel like when I plan it all out, I sound like I'm reading. Like I feel like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't prefer that, but I know some people, like um, one of my friends who's on podcast, she loves to know ahead of time. She wants to frame every answer perfectly and have the perfectly right, you know, perfectly right answer to every perfect question asked. And so it, I think that's actually probably a profile um, preference, but I, I like to be mm-hmm. surprised with whatever's going to come out of your mouth next. Um, and then I think um, I personally prefer podcasts where the guests are willing to talk about failures or um, because that's perfect story, right? A story, if you think about storytelling, the bulk of it is about the hero or the protagonist trying to overcome a difficulty. And then when they overcome the difficulty, they've learned a life lesson. And so many people don't go there. And I don't understand why. So I guess finding guests that'll say, yeah, you know, life is hard. And guess what? I tried this thing and it was awesome. You should try this thing too, you know? And they just don't go there. And I don't know why leaders just don't go there. I think everyone feels like they have to show up at work and be perfect and show up at work and be not flawed, yet every human is flawed, and we all know that life is hard, and yet we just don't talk about it very readily. So, I think the guests that are more transparent and authentic are also ones that I think make a better podcast. Yeah, now I'm feeling motivated to try to surprise you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Good luck. <laughs> so, so let me let me see if I can craft on the spot a, a question that isn't isn't necessarily just like what's a, what's a failure but i'm curious about you know if there's all these characters and stories and like hero identities in stories and if you could sort of look back at the evolution of your identity like the story you tell yourself about yourself was there was there ever a moment when you had to change the story before you could change the the rest of the stuff like you know actually what you were doing on a on a day-to-day basis. Are you talking about change the story, meaning like the narrative of my life? Or are you talking about a communication situation where... Um, like how you see yourself, like changing in, in some sense your own view of yourself that sort of then enabled you to to get past a failure point or something that was troubling you. Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting is... Um, story, like a story framework has become a bit of a coping mechanism for me in life, right? Like, so I'll, I'll be like, whoa, today's been really hard. And I'll be like, oh, that's because I'm in the messy middle. But the decisions I make right now are going to shape the outcome of this story, right? And and I, I do feel like I've learned more about my own identity, my own morals, like a lot of stories are, are driven by morals that you choose. And it, it really has become a coping mechanism. And I, um, I, we catalog, my husband and I, we have a lot of stories and, and we try to catalog them and, and, and work on how we tell them because you can tell them in a way that great, great brings suspense and awe and all of that. And I, and, and, I do feel like in an, in a, everyone's always on an, a journey to embrace their own true self and identity. And I think story and story structures and understanding storytelling has helped me really understand who I am and even where I'm headed. I don't think that really directly answered your question, but I have a real affinity for story. And No, that's, that's super fascinating, especially the part about where I, I'm imagining that it can take some of the pressure off if you say like, oh, my character, me in this story is in the messy middle, which is like the place where they haven't fully conquered the challenge yeah. yet. And 
you know, uh, you, you were talking about like, oh, so many people try to show up at work perfect that, that it would be a huge relief to sort of see your self as a character who is like in the process of figuring something out. Yeah. And that's what it is, right? The rise and fall of tension is conflict. It's conflict with people. It's conflict with yourself. It might be conflict with technology. Oh my God, I had a terrible day yesterday. I had three podcasts and two of them, my technology wasn't working, you know? <laughs> it's like, ah, no. And so our conflicts, it's the six classic story conflicts, right? There's just conflict in life with one of those things and how you, the decision I make today and how I address this conflict will determine uh, if I'm wiser or foolish. Hmm. I'm curious about one thing that's one thing that's come up uh, that I've sort of noticed perhaps is missing in the development of young adults or, or people these days is is rites of passage or <laughs> or ceremony yeah. or yeah. Um, certain symbolism. And uh, you know, I think these are all things that you you find in stories. And I was wondering if you could just speak about. Any of those? <laughs> yeah, I love love this question because I I had a book illuminate where we it's le- it's a leadership story and what happens is in an organizations an employee or even a solopreneur right you struggle to let go of the past and and break with the way things used to be and move on. So my own business we've been here for thirty one years and we have been through eight reinventions. Eight that means almost every four years we're e- it's either a pretty significant tweak or it's like a re a full reinvention now that uh, Bureau of uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics says that a small business, most small businesses don't make it past four to five years. Between four and five years, they fail. And that's more than 50%. I think the last statistic was 54% or something like that. That's a lot. That's half. That's more than half the businesses fail. And I think rites of passage and our ability to acknowledge that um, something needs to end so something new can begin is a lot of the reasons why businesses fail. So a rite of passage could be a marriage, right? You show up. You go through just, I don't know, a five minute to an hour long ceremony and and suddenly you're married and you have in-laws, right? So just <laughs> after you weren't married and had in-laws, but the ceremony, this moment that you've ha- drawn a line in the sand is a moment of demarcation to say, I am no longer single and I am now in a committed relationship. Also, like the rites of passage um, is a um, funeral, is a rite of passage, right? You move from one life into the next and then you celebrate the life. But the bar mitzvah, is a coming of age. In the Mexican culture, we do a quinceanera, which is you show up, you wear a drab little dress and drab little shoes. You go through this ceremony and, and then you're a woman. They're like, oh, you're a woman. Like, what, five minutes went by and you're a woman. <laughs> and you get to wear like a tiara and a scepter and wear these gowns and high heels and put makeup on. Like, it's this moment where you say, I'm going to go back into my same world I've lived in, but I'm approaching it as a woman. I'm not a girl anymore. Nothing really happened other than a ceremony. Money, but you're going back into your world saying, I'm different. I'm changed. I went through this ritual and I'm different and changed. As leaders, we have to do the same things for our employees or customers or travelers. Sometimes clients have a hard time letting go of a product. Like, no, we're not going to resurrect that product. And you have to do some sort of ceremony or some sort of way that you're communicating to say, this is no longer, our future no longer has that in it. And it's a letting go. Like, in the in the quinceanera, you're letting go. The the, um, the girl passes her baby doll during the ceremony to someone else in the room and says, "I'm no longer going to behave this way. I am no longer that person." And the same thing happens in business. We no longer have this product. We had to let this employee go. We are no longer in this business. We're doing a merger and acquisition. There's these moments that mm-hmm. happen where an ending in the minds of the people. There has to be an ending or they won't be able to be new again. And I think leaders don't mark those moments. When a new leader starts and takes over for a former CEO, a lot of things have to end so they can start over again. And you have to be very careful in how you wire in the communication in these moments. They're very heightened sense of very special communication that needs to happen in a really intentional way as a leader in how we communicate. And so so with your last reinvention, what was the reinvention and, and how did you... Uh, communicate about it. So um, there was kind of two that overlapped each other. One of them was that we wanted to become known as story experts. So we were always presentation experts, but the guts of what we were are empathy and then the vehicle is story. And so we've 
now done that. And a big part of that was writing that book, Illuminate, because we story has to appeal to leaders. Anyone who wants to lead needs to know how to be a strong storyteller. And then now this uh, new reinvent, we're right in the middle of actually doing a whole nother reinvention that actually repackages all our services and what we actually even do. Um, And so that's going to be what would be a big reinvention that we're working on right now. I can't tell what we're doing because I haven't told my own employees yet. So we have (laughs) the executive team and a a group is doing like a um, a skunk works project and it's very beautiful and I'm very excited about it. And so, yeah, you have to constantly adapt because your customers are going to be somewhere else in 18 months. So you better be darn confident that you know where they're going to be and that you're ready to meet them there. And so that's a lot about what this reinvention is, is obsessing about what your customer, where your customers are going to be in 18 months or you'll miss them. They'll, you'll be on some other planet and 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 not on the one with them. Mm. It reminds me of, I think, a Wayne Gretzky quote where he says, skate to where the puck is going. Yeah, where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. Yeah. So so, so you talked about um, your, your book, Illuminate. Uh, was that sort of like, did you craft a rite of passage, in a sense, around that book in, in order to signify the change from, from presentation to story? Yeah, we've done, um, there's been a few internal rights of passage. A couple of them are featured in the book. What was what was interesting about the ending, when, when we finished that book, my co-author and I happened to finish it on May Day. And so she brought in little May flowers and, you know, and we, we you know, and then we toasted with champagne and strawberries. We're like, oh my God, we just did a ceremony. <laughs> what was interesting, though, is that is that we lingered and then invited her husband over. And then we went out to our fire pit and told stories. And then it dawned on us. We were like, you know, we did this contrived thing with the champagne and strawberries and flowers. But the real kind of closure of that book happened that night when we sat around the campfire and actually had this cathartic release that we were done. And so we've had, um, we've had uh, we every Martin Luther King Day we have an event called a Shop Day, and um, the reason we pick Martin Luther King Day is we also cast the vision, and and that's kind of what the whole I Have a Dream speech was. So instead of giving everyone. Dr. King's birthday off, we give them their own birthdays off and we ask everyone to come in and work on Dr. King's day. And um, every year there is some sort of rite of passage or ceremony or cathartic activity that we do to get us ready to embrace what the new vision is for the new year. That is real special. That's, that's super cool. Yeah. I can imagine that that people would actually be really excited about working that day when everyone else is, uh, when everyone else is off. (laughs) <laughs> you know, only not that many people in the Bay Area have that day off. It's surprising. Um, so we're really kind of surprised, but we pick it because it's one of the few days we can shut down our whole firm. And uh, people do like having their own birthday off. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. Well, let's see. Is there is there anything that you would like to mention um, in particular about Data Story uh, that we haven't touched on or, or that you just really like to share with our audience? No, I, I, I appreciate it. I um. No, I had a really a ton time a ton of fun writing the book and really studying patterns. I think I'm a pattern finder, like like you are somewhat, and um, I just think data is going to play a role in everyone's future. And so I just I think you did a great job. I'm well, thank good. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that uh, that pattern. You know, it's interesting you talked about AI because AI is good at recognizing patterns, but there's something special about humans as well that we recognize patterns mm-hmm. in a different way. Yeah. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your expertise uh, data and story and and all. Also, your personal life. Really appreciate that. Uh, Well, you're welcome. You did a great job. This was real fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. All right. Another great episode with Nancy Duarte. And it just reminds me that storytelling is a skill that that you can get better at it, which is so important. And I'm re-motivated again to go and practice storytelling. And uh, it it is something that, you know, that you think the natural storytellers, they just must have it. They were born with it, but they just probably practiced and learned it before they even knew that storytelling was a skill you could learn. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end of the episode. And if you're the type of person that likes to help other people, then please share this with your friends and family. If you found value, then they probably will too. And if you have any questions, please just send me an email. My email is derek at derekladdermilk.com and I'm here to help. 
And I do have one personal favor that I'd like to ask. If you haven't already left a rating and a review for the show, that is is really amazing. Uh, first, it lets people know what is valuable about the show, and it helps boost the show up in the ranking so more people can find out about the show. So if you, if you find this valuable, again, let's get this out to more people so that they can be better entrepreneurs and have more freedom in their life and focus on learning cool things that that help them live to their potential. All right, thanks so much for listening today. Now it's your turn to go out there and be adventurous. Mm-hmm.